Good evening, everyone. My name is Nayeli Gomez, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Palo Alto PTI Council. The PTI Council is the umbrella that oversees the 17 schools in our district. On behalf of the Palo Alto PTI Council and the League of Women Voters, I welcome you to our parent ed event, Preventing God Violence, What Parents Can Do to Help. Parents and students and teachers are justifiably concerned that the epidemic of gun violence in our country and the fear that it could impact our, our, our children. Tonight, the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto will be presenting research and talking about parents, teachers, and community members can do to help prevent gun accidents, suicides, and school shootings from happening here. Next slide, please. Our first speaker tonight will be Chloe Chan a freshman at Poly and a volunteer with the League of Women Voters. Chloe will present the student's perspective on this issue. Our next speaker will be Dr. Cole Singer, a Palo Alto parent, Stanford pediatrician, and a gun violence researcher. Erin will present research from Stanford about gun violence and steps that adults can take. Next, Stacy Ashland, Palo Alto parent, co-chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Committee with the League of Women Voters and volunteer Moms Demand Action will present the Be Smart Framework for what all can do to help to prevent gun tragedies in our community. We ask audience members to please keep themselves on mute during the presentation and to put any questions into the chat and they we will leave time to answer those questions for the last 15 20 minutes. A reminder that this Zoom is being recorded. Please be aware of your video camera and your mic. Now, I will hand it over to Chloe to start us off tonight. Hello everyone, I'm Chloe and I'm a freshman at Pali. Today, I'd like to deliver a brief presentation about gun violence and how my fellow peers and I perceive this issue, as well as discuss potential solutions that our community can explore to address it. Next slide, please. Gun violence is a growing concern in many countries, and its impact on teenagers is alarming. Recent incidents like the Texas and Nashville school shootings have brought this issue to the forefront. As a student, I believe that the emotional and psychological harm caused by gun violence on teenagers is significant. High school is already stressed about schoolwork and workload, and the added concern of safety is unacceptable. I've noticed that the school, the Texas school shooting incident affected some of my classmates' academic performance and attendance. Some students found it difficult to focus in school and some happened to be too scared to attend school altogether. This can lead to a decline in academic performance and the inability to reach their full potential. I interviewed three of my friends to gather three thoughts on gun violence. One of them shared, their, shared that gun violence can create a culture of fear and mistrust in communities. Those who have been exposed to gun violence may feel unsafe and mistrustful of law enforcement. This also this can also impact the mental health of students who experience or witness gun violence. They might have trouble entering campus or speaking to anyone, leading to a breakdown in community relationships. Another peer mentioned that it is interesting to see how adults at school are putting the responsibility on their children. While we understand the need to know how to protect ourselves in the events of gun violence incidents, adults whether or not they are gun owners should be the ones with the biggest responsibility. Next slide, please. I came across a video interview about a student who witnessed the Texas school shooting in May 2022. Mia, the girl in the video, recounted how she saw the school, the shooter, kill her teacher and classmates. She tried to hide behind her some of her backpacks with a friend, but the friend got shot and fell dead. In order to protect herself, she grabbed some blood from the ground and put it on herself to pretend she had been killed. She expressed that she no longer feels safe at school and hopes that such a tragedy won't happen again. After watching the video with my friends at school, we were all deeply upset about the young girl had to endure such dramatic, traumatic experience at a young age. We don't think even as high school students, we will be able to handle a situation like that. And we can imagine the pain will carry with her for a really long time. Next slide, please. To address the problem of gun violence, we can take several actions to improve our community. Here are some of my ideas. Firstly, I believe the use of social media platforms like 
Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook to raise awareness and promote gun safety can be effective. Younger kids and teenagers can learn tips on how to prevent getting hurt and learn procedures on how to react and handle dangerous situations. Additionally, creation of educational programs such as 40-minute Zoom meetings or seminars to teach individuals about the safe handling like calling a trusted adult and seek for help. Knowing the storage of materials like door lock blocks can also be very useful. Furthermore, these programs can also include mental health support and resources for everyone. Thirdly, encouraging gun owners to be responsible for their weapons by spreading the message about the importance of gun safety and storage can be helpful. In my first meeting with Stacy, Stacy had told me that most of the guns that were used in school shootings was because the guns weren't locked up. Therefore, spreading the message and encouraging gun owners to be responsible for the guns might be able to reduce the amount of gun violence. Lastly, consideration of banning assault weapons as a possible solution to prevent mass shootings and reduce the number of people getting hurt. This can help lower the number of gun violence because Lisa mentioned that there used to be a law in the United States prohibiting the use of weapons, but it has since expired. Therefore, renewing this law could make our community safer. Based on the points I have that, that I have presented, it is clear that gun violence is a growing concern that affects not only individuals, but also communities as a whole. We have heard stories of survivors and have discussed ways in which we can prevent such incidents from happening again. Through social media, educational programs, encouraging responsible gun ownership, and possibly considering the prohibition of assault weapons, we can take proactive steps to improve the safety and well-being of our communities. It is important that we continue to have conversations like these to raise awareness and advocate for change. As a community, we can work together and create a safer and more secure environment for everyone. I encourage each and every one of you to take the message of this represent uh, of this presentation to heart and consider ways in which you can make a positive impact. Thank you so much for your attention and have a good evening. Thank you, Chloe. I know it wasn't very comfortable to express your fear and frustration about gun violence in our community. Nevertheless, you did a wonderful job and spoke for many of your classmates that feel the same way. I also know that we all agree that we want to do everything we can to help you and your fellow students to feel more comfortable in the scary world we find ourselves in. My name is Erin Holsinger, and I am a parent, a former teacher, a pediatrician, and a gun violence researcher. I want to start by saying that I know many of you received that dreaded text today that said that your child's school had been locked down because of a threat. I think it's good that we can be together tonight as a community to support each other and to discuss what we can do to support our kids. I believe that the only remedy for the anxiety that threatens to cripple us is the knowledge that we're in this together. I hope you all feel the comfort that comes from knowing that there are many parents, teachers, administrators, medical professionals, social workers, law enforcement officers, and administrators that are all working to hard to keep our kids safe. I have twin sons who graduated from Gunn six years ago, just a few months before the terrible shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. After that horrible Valentine's Day, I decided to seek out opportunities to add data about gun violence to the public record. I found many researchers at Stanford who were already doing just that. Next slide. They're from all over the university. You can see a list here, the medical school, the law school, and many other departments. Next slide. They have produced many studies, such as the ones listed here, which examine the impact of gun violence on the mental health of our children and on the economy, and others analyze the causes and potential remedies for gun violence. The last one listed here is one of the two big papers that my group published. This one disproved the idea that people who live in a home with a gun are safer than those who don't. Our findings were the opposite, that adults who live in a home with a gun are more than twice as likely to die by a gunshot injury than those who live in a home with no gun. Next slide. I know that many of us feel a sense that gun violence is something that happens in other places, not here in Northern California. And as this map shows, we are fortunate in California to be in the second best category for gun deaths per capita. We're also lucky to live in a state with the strongest gun laws in the United States. That's according to Gifford. 
So why aren't we in the lowest category for gun deaths? There are many factors, of course, but gun deaths most strongly correlates with gun ownership. And California has 10.4 guns out of 1,000 people, which is 43rd out of 51 states plus DC. Five of the six states in the lowest category there um, have fewer guns than that. Next slide. Some of those deaths are unfortunately children. You have probably heard that nationwide beginning in 2020, gun injuries have been the most common cause of death for children between one and 19. And in California between 2014 and today, 693 children under 17 have been killed and another 1,557 have been injured. So we are certainly not isolated from this problem. Next slide. So what can we as parents do to slow this epidemic? The first tool we should all be aware of is the red flag law or gun violence restraining order. Again, we are very lucky that California has passed a red flag law and was in fact the first state to do so in 2016. I watched with horror a month ago as the first of what has felt like an avalanche of recent shootings occurred in Nashville. We know now that parents and friends had concerns about the stability of the shooter in that case. Perhaps if Tennessee had had a red flag law, police could have taken the guns that ultimately killed six people. In the first three years of the California law, GVROs have been used 58 times in cases of threatened mass shootings. In Santa Clara County, just from May to June of last year, GVROs were used to thwart six gun threats at schools. GVROs can be requested by law enforcement, family members, household members, some co-workers, and certain teachers and school employees. Next slide. So who should we call to start the process for obtaining a GVRO? If the person you are worried might be a danger to him or herself or to others is an adult, call the non-emergency phone number for your jurisdiction. In Palo Alto, that number is listed here, 650-329. 2413. The website speakforsafety.org has great information on the process of obtaining a gun violence restraining order in California. If the person that you are worried might be a danger to him or herself or to others is a student and it is during school hours, call the main office for the student's school. If it is after hours, call the non-emergency phone number for your jurisdiction, the one that's listed above for Palo Alto. Next slide. Another tool that we have available to us is a temporary firearm transfer. This law allows someone to store their gun somewhere away from their residence in case they are worried that they are at risk of using it to harm themselves or others, or in case they are worried that someone in their home might be at risk. As Stacy will tell you in the next slides, storing guns safely is an extremely important, but not foolproof way to keep a child from accessing a gun. If you believe that your child might be at risk because of mental health issues, consider a temporary transfer of your guns to a trusted friend, retailer, or law enforcement precinct. California law allows adults to receive and hold firearms without a background check if it is for the express purpose of preventing self-harm. Now I'll turn it over to Stacy to give you some more great advice on how to keep your kids safe. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you so much to Chloe. I hope that Chloe has logged off and can rest and recover and doesn't need to stay for the rest of the session if she has homework to do or just resting and recovering to do. It was certainly a traumatic day for everybody today. Um, so before I proceed real quickly, I'm just going to ask the audience, looks like we have over 70 people on the, the Zoom, which is great, um, to please either think this number in your head or grab a pen and just write it down or even put it in the chat if you feel so inclined. And the question I want you to think about is, given what you know, how many guns do you think exist right here in Santa Clara County? Just it's a, it's a guess. There will not be a test. You can even Google it if you want, but I want you to think about how many guns you think exist right here in our county, because as Aaron mentioned, it can be um, a common response for us to think that the problem cannot happen here, does not exist here. Um, in fact, one parent told me when she heard about the lockdown today, she, she assumed it was not a credible threat and said it was just 
her assumption that it was just somebody acting out as if there couldn't possibly be guns in homes in Palo Alto. So I'm going to ask you to just think about that number and we'll come back to that in just a second. Next slide, please. Um, so to start with our common goal here, uh, it's, I just think it's important for us all to recognize that we all want our kids to grow up to be happy and healthy and to feel safe, especially at school, especially in their home, especially in their community. Um, and that also we each do have the right to make our own responsible decisions about whether we have a gun that we keep in our home to protect our home, our property, our families, um, or our community. So given that, um, it is also imperative that if we can prevent any, any, even one child from being injured or killed, it is imperative for us to do that. Uh, and I, hopefully those are, those are common goals here. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so here, here's the answer. So typically when I've asked people how many guns they think exist in our county, yeah, I get numbers as low as 2,000, usually 20,000, 30,000 are the highest. Um, Brent was the closest with um, 250,000. The answer is 550,000 is the number that the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and their gun violence, uh, cost of gun violence report that they released last year was that over half a million guns exist in our county. And, and that's just a staggering number to myself and everybody that I talk about this because um, not everybody is wrong, but it's a staggeringly high number for a culture and a community where we tend to feel so safe like we do here in Palo Alto. Additionally, the research shows that uh, Black children and teens are seven times more likely than their white peers to die by guns. And it's not just in urban environments. It happens here, too. Um, so it is it is an equity um, issue. Oh, sorry, backing up for one second. Um, once I started volunteering on on this this work a couple of years ago, um, people would say like, what are you doing in Palo Alto? What do you need to do in California? Aren't we so safe here? What are you possibly doing? And I, I said, you know, it's about safely storing guns and asking about guns in homes. And dozens and dozens, the more I do this work, the more people come up to me and whisper, we have a gun in our home. My husband has a gun. I have a gun. So it's important. This is why this is a parent ed event to recognize that the guns are here in our community, recognize that they're here and that the don't ask, don't tell approach is not a safe approach. We never use that approach for other matters of safety regarding our children. We ask about peanut allergies, booster seats in cars if somebody's going to drive our young child home after a play date or a field trip or something. We ask about supervision at swimming pools so that young children will not be unattended in a dangerous environment. So the biggest part of, of this, this effort is to normalize that conversation about asking about guns in homes because they are here and not asking about them does not make them not be here. Uh, there was a report that came out with the teachers, American Federation of Teachers and National Educators Association worked together with the Every Town for Gun Safety. And the most significant things that they produced from their report was acting and enforcing uh, enacting and enforcing secure gun storage laws, which we passed in Palo Alto, the city of Palo Alto as of December of 2020. Right in the middle of the pandemic, Palo Alto said, yes, gun sales are surging. It is important that we have this ordinance on the books that they must be locked if you have a child in your home. And to normalize this conversation so that it's okay to talk about it, just like it's okay to talk about peanut allergies and bike helmets and so forth. And um, you can go to the next slide, please. So um, there's, there's a study that all these studies are, the links are all in, included here if anybody wants to read um, the details of the research. But this one particular study surveyed people that had adolescents in their homes. And of those, 100% of those parents, 70% of them said, oh, yes, my, my gun is locked securely. My adolescent cannot access it. Then they turned around and asked the adolescents themselves. And about half of those adolescents said, yeah. I know where the key is. I know where the combination is. I know how to get in. I know how to access that gun. So our teens are clever. We'd like them to be clever. We nurture them to be clever. Um, and we parents can underestimate our teens. We can think they don't know something that they really do. So it is imperative upon us to reassess those uh, those methods and ensure that it is is not acceptable, not accessible to a young person. As Chloe mentioned early on, this particular uh, study here says 76% of school shooters 
committed the school shooting using an unsecured gun found in their own home or the home of a friend or a relative. So it doesn't have to be your gun. It doesn't have to be your home. But if, it, if it's unsecured, it is a risk to, to our community. Um, and lastly, that school shooters, 76%, again, all these numbers are in the 70s, tend to post warning signs in advance. In this case, it says disturbing content on social media prior to committing the school shooting. Um, so that's why it's important that, that parents know what to do and that teens feel comfortable coming home and telling their parents and so that the parents can act in an appropriate way um, to respond to something that could potentially be a threat. Next slide, please. Um, the Be Smart uh, framework is something that Moms Demand Action um, promotes, and I just think it's a wonderful, simple acronym to remember the letters of SMART, that S is secure the guns in your homes, and M is model responsible behavior about keeping those guns unloaded and separately locked from the ammunition. Um, not joking around, but to be very clear and model responsible behavior. Um, the other letters are A, ask about the presence of guns in homes. I just keep coming back to peanut allergies. We ask about peanut allergies. We need to ask about guns. Recognizing the role of guns in suicide. Uh, and Erin mentioned some of the research on that as well. And we've been through so much in Palo Alto with, um, with suicides in the past. And the one thing that a lot of us learned took away from it is to reduce the access to the means by installing cameras at the train tracks by installing guards at the train tracks for all those years reducing the access to the means reduces the likelihood that the that the suicide will happen and lastly the t's just tell other people about what you learn here tonight ask them how many guns they think exist in our county tell them that the number that Santa Clara County came out with last year was over half a million. Share this information so that it doesn't remain in the don't ask, don't tell category. We also like to say, you don't have to wait um, to for somebody to ask you if you have a gun, because a lot of people say, oh no, I never would have a gun. Or I'd be, if one woman even said to me, I'd be offended if somebody asked me if I had a gun in my home. I would rather take that risk of offending somebody than take the risk that my children could access a gun in that house. So you can volunteer your own information. So I'll be glad to host the kids over at my house for a play date after school. And just so you know, we have a cat and a dog if there's any allergies. And you know, yes, we have a gun and it's securely locked, unloaded and securely locked so the children cannot ask it. Or we have a gate around our swimming pool so nobody can fall in unattended. And remember that it's not about whether or not there's a gun in the home. It's about whether it is securely stored, unloaded, and locked. And if this conversation is awkward at first, it's absolutely fine. In fact, sometimes a lot easier to have this conversation by text and email. I just have to ask. There are a significant amount of graphics and resources and handouts and videos on the besmartforkids.org website that is referenced here. And those resources are available in both English and Spanish. And they are for parents and they are for schools and PTAs and anybody wants, that wants to share this information with other people can access it. Next slide, please. Um, so for the people that are, are gun owners, and I know we have some of them on the call because like I said, they're my friends. They tell me, they tell me the truth. Um, ensure that your gun is, is securely locked, unloaded and stored. The gun is locked separately. The ammunition is locked separately. Biometric locks, you don't have to risk is the key on top of the cabinet or is somebody going to guess the four letter, four digit combination. Biometric locks use your fingerprint and some of them even can store up to 20 fingerprints so that it is still easily accessible but cannot accidentally be accessed by a child. And modeling the responsible behavior and gun owners themselves should also ask about guns in homes and not just assume that other parents are securely locking theirs. And then we can go to the next slide, please. And for all parents, whether you own a gun or not, the ask is my, my big ask to you is to get comfortable asking, just like you do about peanut allergies, bike helmets, swimming pools, driver's licenses, drinking and driving. Ask about these guns and you will, you will learn a lot. Will everybody tell the truth? No. Some people will be afraid to tell you they have a gun because there's stigma, but you've asked and you've given them the opportunity to say, I understand that it needs to be stored safely or if they say it's stored under the bed, make it a deal breaker. This happened to me with a member of my own family some number of year, years ago, shortly after Sandy Hook, as a matter of fact, my kids were still pretty young and I wanted to bring my kids to visit this, this relative out of state. And I simply said, 
I know you have a gun and I know it's under the bed and I will not bring my children to your house. And I was told, oh, they'll never find it. They'll never find it. And I said, well, we're just not coming. It's a deal breaker until they installed a lock that my children could not access. And then I was happy to bring my, my children to visit this, their family members, knowing that they could be curious and safe. So that just absolutely has to be a deal breaker. I like that BeSmart mentions the teen babysitters. If your, your teen is going over to another house to babysit a young child, the teen doesn't have to make it like their own issue. They can say, my parents just wanted me to ask if you have a gun in the house and if it's stored safely. They can be empowered to ask that and receive the answer. There's a real brief video. Um, I, Whoever is running, flipping the slides, I think Carrie or Hillary, if you could click on that YouTube link, it's a very, very short video that I think says it better than I can. And you have to unmute the yourself, I think, your computer. Tell as many people as you can to be smart. Nearly 1,500 American children are killed by gun every year. A couple of them will spend money sitting with seniors. As a non gun owner, it does not matter if it's your gun or not, it can't be your child. I store my guns responsibly. I ask my neighbors and my friends to do the same thing. It's nuestra responsabilidad. Let's change the not my problem culture and start the conversation today. Great, thank you. I'll give you a second to get back to the slides. Thank you so much. Okay, and now yeah. Oh, there's there's some there's so much example language on the Be Smart for Kids website um, of how to how to phrase this, even though it may feel awkward at first. Such as, thank you for inviting my child over to your house for your awareness. He has no food or pet allergies. Um, and I just have one more station safety question. Do you have any guns in the home, and are they secure? Because children can be very curious and parents that are happy, usually happy to say, no, we don't, or yes, they're securely locked. And if they don't give you an answer that you're comfortable with, you can say, how about I invite the kids to play for a play date at my house or we, or we meet at the park, some way to remove the risk. And you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so that brings us to the end, end of our prepared. I know we've been seeing a lot of questions come in on the chat. And we will be um, taking those now. If um, uh, Chloe came to us as a student volunteer through the League of Women Voters, and obviously League of Women Voters members and all adults in the community and teens are welcome to be involved in our gun violence prevention efforts. So if you'd like to join us, that link can take you there. The Be Smart for Kids uh, website is there as well. Please share this information with other parents, caregivers, grandparents, teachers, any adult in the community can be a part of the solution here. And I would like to thank the PTA Council so much for, for hosting us tonight. And then I'll turn it over for questions. Wow. Thank you so much for all the information that you have shared today. Too many resources available. Thank you uh, to Chloe Chan, Dr. Erin Holzing, Cole Singer, and Stacey Ashland. So let's go and move uh, to the questions and answers. So we have the first question and is, can you comment on today's incident at Pali? And I don't know if that's anybody in particular. Um, Whoever is um, willing to comment on that. I, I don't have any information other than what has been posted publicly on the Palo Alto online and on the Palo Alto police that the situation was resolved. Um, I don't know, Aaron, if you have any further information you want to share. No, I I know only um, gossip and innuendo, which unfortunately is what um, what goes around until we all get official word. Is anybody on the call that's maybe from the district and could um, give more more information? We'd we'd love to hear more. I think everyone was um, extremely scared and um it would it would be great to have thank you jennifer please absolutely it's it's all you hey um i mean i don't have a ton of information um but i do know that from the minute the police arrived they did not feel like it was an imminent threat and recommended we proceed as a shelter in place um my impression was that the shelter in place was so that um 
kids stayed in their classrooms so that as police were there and investigated, they would notice anyone who was walking by, right? Like no one should be out of their classrooms at that point. So it made it very easy to notice if someone was not where they were supposed to be. Um, it really helped to manage and investigate the situation much more smoothly while kids were still in school. Um, but again, this is sort of my, what I'm, what I'm getting. Um, the police were on scene right away. The police felt there was, they, as you saw from the first message they sent out, they did not feel like there was an imminent threat. Um, and the day proceeded as as it, you know, meant to. Um, I know that at the um, what what I was told was that as is typical now that an incident happened, and you know, incidents happen a lot. There are bomb scares. There are things that happen on social media. There are all kinds of things that happen. And whenever an incident happens, the district does what you would call a retro or you know whatnot. That you look back over what happened. What is our policy? Did we follow our policy? Were the practices sound? Are we happy with them or do we want to make any changes? And then, you know, we'll get an update after we get it. So right now there's not a whole lot to say because we did everything the police told us to do. And now we'll go ahead and do our retro and, and see what we come up with. That's kind of all I have. I don't know if that's very helpful, but. Thank you so much. That was Jennifer Di Brianza, board member. Thank you. And let's go to our second question then. And it is, um, Santa Clara is very diverse in culture and community. Please give a more precise number of guns for Palo Alto, Los Altos, and Menlo Park. Yeah, we unfortunately do not have that information. Um, but guns can be purchased out of state and brought across the border. Guns can be purchased in other cities and brought into Palo Alto. It is because we don't have um, mandatory registration, universal background checks. It is not possible for us. To, I've, I've searched, it took me over a year to find the information from the county. Um, I even called the Department of Justice in Sacramento and started asking for this information over a year ago. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have that. Guns are freely moving around our community. So unfortunately, we don't have precise information. Thank you so much about that. We understand. Uh, that too. And let's go to our third question. And I think this could be a question for Jennifer DiPrianza again. <laughs> um, has PSUSD board committed to sending out an annual letter to PAUSD parents every new school year committing to store guns safely? This is the usual protocol around many of our surrounding districts. Boards send out a letter to all parents with letters signed by the superintendent and chief of police advocating and asking parents to commit to storing guns. Jennifer, if you can comment uh, on this one, and of course, uh, if Dr. Uh, Holsinger and uh, Stacy Ashlyn can also uh, complement, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll do my best. So this year, um, after the city um, passed their their ordinary their safe storage ordinance. Uh, a letter, the superintendent's weekly update, you know, it, it was included there. And there is talk about putting it into our annual update, you know, when you have to read different things and sign different things. And the concern is that that'll get buried because there's a lot of stuff there. Um, so I think right now they're trying to figure out what's the most effective way to communicate it. We already did send it out this year, um, but what is the best way to send it out next year where it'll get to everybody and not just people that read certain things. I mean, you know, I'm sure anyone that has kids in the school district knows there are times we send stuff out and people didn't see it because we send too much stuff out or it was at the bottom of an email or, you know, it went to their spam or there's all kinds of reasons that certain ways are better than other ways or worse than other ways. Um, so I think we're just trying to figure out the most effective way to communicate it. But we do communicate it every year. It's just a question of how to do it most effectively. Um, can, can I? Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, state, state Superintendent Thurman um, recommended this, um, has been recommending this, the National PTA has been recommending this, and it did pass into state law uh, this past year. I believe we have, uh, districts have until this fall to begin the annual notification. And I just received a notification from district staff um, today on the about the board policy that would go into place about this. And the California Department of Education has not yet released the wording of how, what this will be in district policy. Um, we 
do you know that it will say that guns must be stored safely? The question I'm still working on with Moms Demand Action to try to find out is if that wording will also recommend that parents ask about the presence of guns in their in their home. So we're following that issue, but we haven't got that wording finalized yet. Um, I did hear that the state law was was sort of a a checkbox when you annually re-register your child for school, just like you check boxes on all the other things that you've been alerted to, um, which might not necessarily be like, like Jennifer said, um, something that gets the attention of parents. Um, that's why I think some of the, the graphical flyers and letters and social media graphics on Be Smart are, are might have a more impactful way. And as Chloe suggested, um, to reach parents um, through these other other platforms and even teens, because really our kids should be allowed to be kids and worry about prom and homework and play dates and cleaning their room. And they shouldn't have to worry about protesting um, and, and, and lockdown drills and, and fear. So um, I think that um, sadly our, our teens are in the same position as the adults right now. And that is unfair to them in their childhood. I think it's incumbent upon us as adults to make sure that we are pushing this issue through our schools, through our PTAs and making it really clear. And the messaging can be different for what you tell elementary school parents versus what you're gonna say to high school parents. So I do think it needs to be, it can be and should, probably should be customized for each level of education about how we communicate to parents um, what, what role they can take in safety. Thank you so much, Stacey, uh, for complimenting this. And, and the next question is actually like very connected with what you just said. And is um, can PAUSD insert a question with registration and ask if there are guns in the house and if they are safely stored? What do you think? Do you think that could be um, a good way for for parents to be or to have like more peace of mind? Uh, I, I'm happy to answer that. My first thought to that is that. We can't share anyone's anyone any data information they give us with any other family. So we could collect it, and maybe asking the question might encourage people to be reflectful, reflecting on it. But if you're hoping to have a play date with another kid, you can't come to the district to find out whether or not they've told us. You know, they've self-reported that they're safe storing. They might not be honest, and we can't share that information in any way. So I don't think that's an effective way. I really think setting the culture that Be Smart talks about of just, it's one of the questions you ask, right? Allergies and car seats and gut safe storage. And someone might get offended. Um, but I started doing it when my kids were at Ohlone, and it was, it was fairly rare. <laughs> um, but most people just answered me. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, well. This is another question that goes um, directly to um, the, the district basically is, will the student input will be asked for the follow-up debrief on today's incident? I don't know if anyone can actually help us to answer that question. Jennifer, do you think you can? Um, will the kids be asked? I would imagine mm -hmm. the kids will be asked. Again, board member, I'm not admin, <laughs> not staff of the district. Um, I imagine they would ask the kids, but I'll definitely inquire when they do their retro is getting feedback from kids part of it. You know, I mean, I've got two kids at Pally now and a lot of their friends, you know, are all talking and, and most of the kids we talked to didn't have many thoughts at all about it. They were actually, I don't know if this is a signal of desensitization or if it's a signal of, making their own mental, uh, you know, protection, sort of self-preservation, but they just weren't, they, they had the sense being on campus that it was not an imminent threat. I don't know if they got that message from a teacher or from the police or whatnot, but I think we parents at home were more anxious than most of the kids were. I'm sure there were some kids that were really scared. Um, so uh, I think it's a great idea. I don't know what their plans are, but I'll definitely inquire. Yeah, definitely. I think like all our community was shocked by what happened um, today. And uh, well, the next question is, uh, and thank you again, Jennifer, for being like very uh, willing to help us out, like answering like questions. And uh, whenever there is a threat to school, false or not, during class hours, wouldn't it be a good idea to bring in many police officers and register all classrooms for weapons? not only close the classrooms 
and wait. Is this one me again? <laughs> I, 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 I can say you can answer it, but I, I, I don't know if actually um, like Dr. Erin or Stacy have like any suggestion about that or any, you know, anything that you can um, yeah, participate with on this one too. I mean, the only, the work that we at the league have been doing with the police in Palo Alto is once we got the safe storage ordinance passed, um, we're still working on the city. There is a program where the city can hand out free gun locks. Um, we just have to do some work to um, to make that happen. Um, so the city could put on an educational effort and, and include, um, I think it's called Project Child Safe or something like that, where if you have a gun in the home and you have children in the home and you want a free gun lock, the police should be able to do that if we can get that program to happen. I think that would be wonderful. But as far as um, police actions and searching classrooms and so forth, uh, that is that is out of our hands as 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 the league, and that is in the the police category. So don't, I don't have information on the specifics about what they do, other than and what recommendations are. Yeah, and so people know I don't I don't get the impression anyone was just waiting. I think that there are um, my understanding is there's no more than eight police officers on duty at a time in Palo Alto, and five of them were on Pally's campus for much of the day. Um, and my daughter happened to be in the classroom that got the threat. Their classroom was moved, but they were told to leave their backpacks where they were, so that if anyone had anything in their backpack, the police searched all of those backpacks, while the kids just left with their phone, and that was it. Um, and I don't know what they did from there. I just know from, because she was in that room, what they did. Um, so, and they, and they started interviewing kids in that classroom too, um, because that's the room where the threat was. So that's where they started their focus. But, you know, if everyone was in a shelter in place and they're in their own rooms, then once they checked the backpacks in that room, yeah, I don't know if they started going room to room or if they just left the doors closed. Um, but I'm sure that they, I mean, they're trained for these things now. They're trained a lot for these things now. So I trust them. There were five of them there and that they, they followed what they thought was best practice. Thank you again. And our next question, as kids age, parents are no longer necessarily involved in the other, in the other households their students visit. What's the appropriate way to get this information? Um, yeah, there is information on Be Smart, uh, Be Smart for Kids website uh, that parents can talk to their kids so that their kids know what's appropriate. And they have age appropriate information on there. So they do have different information, whether you're talking to an elementary or, uh, student or a teenager um, on, on there. They do have resources for having that conversation. Um, and again, I think it's pretty similar to how my, my kids have both graduated from, uh, from PAUSD as well. but um, I made it, we made it very clear and open communication to them when they were still like on high school to be aware of things like drinking and driving. Um, and this is something that the teens these days also need to be aware of um, about what the environments are, because yeah, we stopped supervising their play dates at some point. And that is, that is a good thing. Um, and they, they need to learn to be aware of their surroundings as, as well. Thank you. Next question is, asking parents is a good idea. Do you think parents should share with their kids whether there is a gun store safely in the home they are visiting? There seems to be a risk of increasing curiosity in kids to go looking. What do you think? Hang on one second. I I need to. Can you? I'm trying to to find that so I can reread it. Or <laughs> no worries. I I can actually like uh, repeat the question again. Okay. As asking parents is a good idea. Do you think parents should share with their kids whether there is a gun store safely in the home they are visiting? Oh. There seems to be a risk of increasing curiosity in kids to go looking. Yeah, I I think that depends on the age of the child. Um, for sure. And um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, I it depends on the age of your kid and what, what you feel comfortable with them knowing and not knowing, but I might not necessarily sell, <laughs> say you should, to my child, A, you should know. I, I 
when my kids, like I said, when they were in high school, I was very open about, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable with you hanging out at so-and-so's house for whatever reasons, maybe it was drinking and driving behavior or whatever. Um, but, uh, that that's really personal decision. And like I said, there are resources about, about talking to your child, but that will vary from family to family and age of the child. Thank you. Next question is, even if doc Dr. Austin sends out a letter asking if there's a secure gun in the home, there is no law in forcing people to give a truthful answer. I think it's better to give info on how that gun could hurt their own child, especially given the increase in mental health issues. I think it could be great to let parents know what will happen to the parents legally if their kids do damage to others on their property. Is there a way to promote the message of consequences? Um, I, before, I would like Aaron to jump in here if possible, but before I do, I just wanna be clear, we're not asking the district to ask parents if they have a gun in their home. That is definitely private personal matter. We are not asking the district to ask parents. We are asking parents to ask other parents. Um, it is, it is not the district's business what, what we have in our home, especially because it is legal to own a gun. It's just a matter of safe storage. Um, but Aaron, do you want to chime in about some of the other uh, risks on that? Well, I, I'm having trouble finding that question here, but it sounds like the, it was about consequences of um, violating the safe storage. Is that right? Whether they're so California law does include some some liability and, um, you know, a misdemeanor charge associated with not properly storing a gun if you're living in a home that has um, minors there. So so they're there are consequences associated with those provisions. It's not just a recommendation, it's a, a fully enforceable law. Um, but was the question about whether people should be made aware of those consequences? Was that the question? Yes, the consequences legally um, about that. Well, certainly, I I would suggest that that would be an appropriate part of a um, of of the mailing of the um, advertising to parents that they are made aware that not only is it a law, it is it is a law that comes with um, potential consequences. So, I certainly think that should be a part of it. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Erin. So, um, next question in regards to the incident today. Can Pali please have counselors come into the classrooms tomorrow to talk with the kids about what happened? Having counselors available is ineffective since most students, mine included, would not go outfield their way to seek counseling support. So I think, um, Jennifer, <laughs> are you still with us? I am. I am. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what that would look like because say there's six counselors on campus and there's 200 classrooms, but then the kids are switching before they can get to all the classrooms. So, you know, someone's going to get, get a counselor three times and someone's not going to get a counselor at all, uh, depending on schedules, because there's the nature of a high school, uh, classroom. Um, I, I think they're going to make them very available. Um, but, uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to inquire, but my guess is logistically it would be literally impossible <laughs> to hit every kid in a classroom. Um, but but I'll, I know that they are committed to being there and available and I'll find out if there's any way logistically you can pull that off. Thank you so much. We appreciate your, your response. Uh, next question. Read thread at Palo Alto today. Um, my child, um, uh, let me just right because this um okay uh rethread at pali today my child told me that during first period the pe kids and teachers were unaware for the first 20 30 minutes then when they found out three pe classes shelter in the boys gym class can jennifer de Brianza speak on why pe kids and PE teachers had such a huge delay in information and what to do in a gun threat minutes matter. 
why was communication so poorly delayed and poorly conveyed? That sounds like a very important part of the retro. So I will make sure they know to look into that. And I'm sure that the principal is talking to all the teachers. Um, he probably already knows that, but I'll, I'll confirm that that's on the radar. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for help us out with this one too. Um, uh, next question. Given the events in the country, we can underestimate what happened today. Will the police further investigate and find the person who wrote the messages? Um, we, we don't I, have... I think it's again, Jennifer, I'm so sorry. Yeah, we don't have <laughs> and, and I am totally understand. I mean, Jennifer DiBrianza is a board member, so she's not uh, PAUSD staff, but we want to thank you, Jennifer, for being here and being willing to share your own experience since your daughter was part of the classroom that was threatened. So um, thank you so much. If you would like to uh, uh, respond, so we appreciate that. If, if okay. not, if you're not available, we understand that too. Thank no, you. No, that's fine. I I just I know that we very, we're very lucky to have the experts that we have in, for for general gun safety and safe storage. Um, so I want to make sure that there's time for those questions as well. Um, I would say very quickly: Will the police further investigate? They have been, and um, the if if our schools were not going to be turned into basically prisons with tall walls and gates all around them because they're very open campuses that would be hard to do. Um, we were committed to making sure that we had high quality cameras at every campus and there are high quality cameras at our campuses. So I would not be surprised if the district and the, and the uh, police department have already identified on a camera someone who was putting that sign up, whether early this morning or, you know, overnight or something. Um, and for sure, there it, there's potentially criminal charges. It depends on, you know, what the circumstances are. But yeah, they caused trauma today. Um, and that's not okay. So I think um, that they, I know they're for, further investigating. Um, and they will do their best to find out. Thank you again. Um, next question. Oh, uh, could this, the shortage of our uh, Counselors able to approach the students be aided by having an entire school discussion based on my son's reactions to the events of the morning and from what I have heard from other parents, a debrief could be most helpful. So I think this one is kind of um, uh, similar to other uh, questions. Uh, if you want to address it as well, Jennifer, we. Yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure they'll communicate what their what their plans are. Um, I think, I mean, a, a shortage of counselors, yeah, a shortage of counselors to get into every classroom at the same time, but we have, you know, some of the best ratio of counselors to students in the state. So I wouldn't say that we have a shortage of counselors, but certainly trying to get to every student at the same time, um, which is why typically we just offer availability. Um, but I hear the concern that some kids that might need it might not reach out for it. Um, so continuing to work with the counselors or ask the counselors to think about if kids aren't reaching out, but we think that they actually need someone to reach out to them, what, what can we do? Um, and at the beginning of the year, they do that generally. They send a, a questionnaire to every student and they end up following up with students that have some concerning answers or that seem like they need someone to touch base with them. So maybe they'll do that again. Thank you. Next uh, question. Oh, uh <laughs> the coming two questions are uh, same, um, I mean, a PAUSD oriented. Um, it's uh, for parents who care and want to advocate more for safe gun um, storage, what can the average PAUSD parent do to help in advocacy to reduce gun violence and safe gun storage on a larger level? Besides asking other parents if they have stored their guns safely. Oh, I think you can um, help us answer this one, uh, Dr. Holsinger and Stacy. Please, thank you. Um, we can uh, we can do the be smart a more just a be smart presentation with more detail uh, at individual schools, or if we want to do one for elementary and one for middle and one for high. We we have absolutely have tons of volunteers who are willing to help give this information out um, that would be appropriate to each school level if that is of interest. Um, and this is something we've been working with PTA Council. We started right after the Marjorie Stoneham, the 
Parkland, Florida shooting um, when uh, Eileen uh, and I worked together because she was, I think, health and wellness VP on the PTA council. So we've been working on this like since 2019 um, to get this information out. So we are open to helping the schools in any way um, that you guys would like. Um, the beast, we have we have we have flyers, we have handouts, we have buttons, we have stickers. <laughs> we can share the beast part information with anybody that wants to hear a lot more detail on it. There's there's more videos. Um, and like I said, the resources are are um they're very appropriate for the for the different age levels on there. So if that's helpful, feel free to let us know and we'd be glad to to do that for you guys. Thank you, Stacey, for sure. That the VSmart is very um yeah very helpful. Um next question. So can the can the PAUSD uh commit to telling parents about their safe storage responsibilities more than once a year as required by a state, by a state law, but also several times a year using social media, such as videos, animation, et cetera. If the district feels the message would be ignored in the regular reading uh, notices that go out at the beginning of the year, This is the perfect timing for this question. <laughs> At the next school board meeting, which is not next, which is two weeks from today, um, on our agenda is adopting our PAUSD promise for next year. And one of the new, well, bullet is a bad word for it, but one of the new goals <laughs> under um, wellness and safety is um, gun, gun violence prevention education. Um, and we are adding that due to the advocacy of many people on this call, including Stacey Ashland, um, to make sure that we are doing what we can to educate and that we are partnering with PTAC and the city and the police to do as much education as they can. So it's becoming one of one of the main goals in our promise next year. So feel free two weeks from now, you can either call in or you can come in and you can comment on the item and um, show support for raising that as a priority in the coming year. Thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. Uh, next question, uh, it says, Erin or others, do you know anything about the type of kids that make these threats? Example: Warning signs. If there were, uh, if there were a real threat, what is the best thing for parents to do during the incident? Um, there, there certainly are some things known about general out, generalities of um, kids who make threats, and and even more known about kids that ultimately um, bring a gun to school or who. Um, are actually school shooters. Those those have been studied. Um, you know, we we never like to just make blanket categorizations, of course. Um, but you know, there certainly is a much larger percentage of young men than young women who are are school shooters. Um, the profile of them, again, this is this is just a very rough characterization, but they they tend to be kind of. Uh, loner kids who um, aren't necessarily involved in a lot of activities, and um, many of them point to um, bullying as as part of their as part of their lives. Um, they they do frequently um, point to problems that they're having on social media. So um, often they could could potentially be identified by either other kids or. Um, hopefully some adults that are aware of their social media presence um, that can identify them as being troubled and, and needing to have some um, mental health intervention to try to address those issues. But, um, you know, there's just nothing that, that compares to um, parent involvement in those kids' lives, being, being an, an active member of their of their social media community and um, knowing their friends and, and just being involved. Um, the second question was, if there were a real threat, what is the best thing for parents to do during the incident? Um, all, all I can say is to try to give law enforcement space. I think that's maybe the most important thing. You know, our tendency, of course, is just to want to um, rush up to school and, and grab your kid. Um, immediately out of school and bring them home. Uh, you know, that would be my tendency as well. But um, but we really need to give law enforcement plenty of space 
and um, you know, to congregate somewhere that law enforcement has directed us and 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 wait there for further instructions. It's it feels extremely um, helpless, but I think just staying out of the way is is the best thing that we can do uh, in that case. And um, I, I I think there's even someone from the police department on on the call. Is there anybody that might want to add to that? What should we as parents do if there were an actual um, shooting? We do have Vice Mayor uh, Greer Stone on the call. I don't know if he um, wants to address this regarding the the police involvement. It's it's not under the school board's purview. It's under City Council. So, I, if... <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um. As far as the, can you repeat the question. I'm trying to find it here. I think they just want to know what should parents do if if we did get that worst case scenario tax that there was an active shooting on a campus, what should we do? Yeah, I mean, very good question. The What the police say, and I know I'm sure from a parent perspective, this is not going to be uh, an adequate response. But what the police say is that do not try to uh, call the call the school, call police, text things like that because of the concern that it can overrun the airwaves and and everything else. And so their request, though I understand, may feel unreasonable, is to stay patient and allow them to do to do their job. Um, that question has been asked of them, and and that has been the response. And I would say. They are very well trained in these areas. I know they hold active, um, active drills. Uh, I haven't had a chance to speak with the police chief today, but did get an update. Uh, and and I, I know there was a question earlier about is an investigation going on and definitely can assure that the police department is actively investigating the case. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Mayor Greerstone for jumping in to complement that question. Thank you so much. We're glad to yeah. have you here. Thank um, you, this has been a great, um, a great event. <laughs> Thank you. Next question, can PAUSD, PTSA or PTAC commit to doing Be Smart for Kids presentation across all three middle schools and two high schools? And I think that is also, um, Redirected to PAUSD, Jennifer can help us with that too, with that. but also to us, right? To the to the PTI Council. So I, I could say we 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 we're going to work together. So uh, the PTI Council and all the PTAs are committed um, to do uh, to to work together to to do not only this parent ed. Um, uh, events and webinars, but also to help out um, in the best way we can. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, education for kids mm -hmm. is really important. And uh, we've had the League of Women Voters interested in partnering with us, PTAC interested in partnering with us, the police. Um, I think we got some more comments in the chat too. Moms Demand Action is always willing to help. So I think that for sure, that's something I'm, I'm really excited. This is going to be a stated priority in the promise, because I think it's going to really free us up to work with a lot of um, groups and make sure this happens, especially at our secondary schools. Agree. Totally. It's a teamwork and we're very good at it, right? <laughs> we're committed and uh, ready to tackle that. And okay. So next question, do you have a handout of all the related uh, California laws. Yeah, we can put that together in a handout and we will share that as well. Awesome, thank you. Next question, what are the legal consequences to the kid and his, her parents in today's incident? Hopefully they will not be considered an adult where charges will be higher. Are there awareness campaigns for parents to know the legal repercussions? Jennifer, can you help us? Is that me? That I mean, I, I have no idea. Um, I do know, I mean, there's lots of times that students in our district get in trouble for making a threat on social media or making a threat on campus. 
And um, we try to find that balance where we hold them accountable and yet we acknowledge that they're children. Um, so I think, I can't say how anyone's gonna handle it. I would say the police are the first to handle it and then it will come to us after that. Totally, thank you. And next question, is there a system in place like emergency broadcast to parents and students via phone text to PAUSD community if there is a bomb threat or gun threat? I think you got it today. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Back before there were, no, back before there were cell phones and all of our kids told us, hey, we just went into lockdown. Um, that's how we would have found out a little bit later, right? If we didn't hear from our kids, uh, it was about 15 minutes later. And as soon as we had a, a basic assessment of the situation, um, someone crafted a message that went out to everybody at Pali um, saying there will be more information coming later. Um, so it's not as fast as some of us would, would like, but at the time, staff and the police were doing everything they could to make sure that the kids were safe and that's their number one priority. And then as soon as it was possible, it turned to communicating with us. Thank you. That's the most important thing that they keep our kids safe at all times. Uh, next question. Education and counseling can only do so much. There are disturbed people everywhere in this world. Everyone, however, does not have access to guns. Assuming that there is a chance at some point a kid or adult will be disturbed and have a loaded gun, has PAUSD thought about preventive uh, measures? say having fences and security at the school entrances and cameras at the school or any other preventative me measure? Is this about money? I'm so sorry that you're hearing my voice again. <laughs> I will answer as briefly <laughs> as I can. Thank you so much. But this has been a conversation for several years and California schools, ours included, are designed in a very open sort of way. <laughs> and short of building 12 foot walls around them and making a singular entrance where everyone has to walk through, there's not a whole lot we can do to really lock them down. We have done things you might notice at your elementary schools or at your middle schools, some strategic gates or fences have gone up in different places, things that just encourage people to come to the front entrance. Um, but sadly, if you look at a lot of the mass the school shootings that have happened, oftentimes they have been secure buildings, what you'd call you know, hard closes or, or closed buildings. Um, and sometimes there has been an armed guard that oftentimes has just been shot before anyone even knew anyone was approaching the school. So I, I don't think there is any way anyone has found to secure your way to safety in this incident. It's why it speaks to the work that Moms Demand and other organizations do trying to make us all a lot safer um, to minimize the odds of this happening. Thank you so much, Jennifer, um, again. And we have uh, no more questions, but we do have uh, a couple comments that I want to read. And the first one is, as a parent of raising Pali freshmen, I'm shocked up with what happened at Pali's today. As the event play out, I consider the idea of how to protect our children when this happens more than just locking up and hoping it goes away. We should stock classroom with bulletproof vests and helmets. That's one um, comment. And the other comment is, hi, I am a PTA president in the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. This was a very interesting and necessary discussion. Until now, I have never thought about putting gun violence discussions and education on our agenda and into our community. Now I do. Thank you. Sorry to hear about the Palo Alto incident today. Well, thank you for that comment. Um, maybe, uh, the third comment, maybe what we all can do is work as hard as we can to elect politicians who will demand sensible gun control. Can we have links to how to support organizations like Moms Demand Action? And Thank you uh, everyone for your uh, comments and questions. Uh, I would like to hand out like the mic to our presenters. Uh, so you have an opportunity to give us a closing statement before we wrap up the event. Who wants to, to start? <laughs> Open mic. 
I, I am happy to go next. I, I am go so, ahead. so appreciative for PTA Council for working with us on this and giving us this forum to, to share this information with parents in our community. And I'm immensely uh, grateful for Chloe, a Pally student, having been through what she's been through today for uh, volunteering with the League of Women Voters and giving us the student perspective because it is heartbreaking but important for us to hear that this is, is the reality. Um, and lastly, uh, Dr. Erin Holtzinger, you are a hero. Everybody seems to know your name. You have so much wealth of information as a pediatrician, a teacher, a parent, and a gun violence researcher. You're like the gold standard. And I so appreciate uh, your efforts in sharing us this information as well. And thank you to the 70 some percent participants that we've had on the call all night. That's um, awesome. Not awesome that we have to be here, but awesome that people are willing to learn about what they can do. So thanks. And thank you to Jennifer uh, DeRianza for speaking about the school board. Shauna Siegel for the school board was also on and Greer Stone from city council, vice mayor Greer Stone for, as well. I appreciate your time as electeds to participate because I know your time is spread very, very thin and it's, it's, um, it's great that you can be here. Yeah, I'll just, um... Uh, add thank you to Stacy and Hillary from the League of Women Voters for uh, asking me to to join the call. Um, I am really inspired to hear so many people in our community that are singularly focused on keeping our kids safe. It it really um, makes me feel confident that um, everything that that can be done is being done, and I feel like um, our our kids are really situated um, really well to to handle these issues. Um, so so thank you to everybody in our community for for chipping in and being willing to um, talk about these issues, um, to legislate for these issues, to create ordinances in the the district that uh, brings awareness to these issues. it's it's really inspiring and I uh, just wish that we could get the rest of the country on board because unfortunately um, most most communities don't don't feel this way and and don't have the same the same perspective. So I'm I'm really grateful to everyone here and uh, I just will promise that um, um, the academic community will continue to look at this and see if if we can create data and um, and get knowledge out there that will hopefully lead to more effective policies. Chloe, do you want to share some words with us too? Um, yeah. So thank you everyone for listening and coming to our um present like presentation. And I'm really glad that Stacy and Hillary invited me to this event. So me and my peers can talk and says like sad things that we want to say to our community. Well, I would like to close um this parent ed webinar. Uh, thanking you, uh, Chloe Chen, Dr. Erin Holsinger, Stacy Ashland, Hillary Glenn, for all the valuable information you share with us today. Thank you to our PTA President, Kerry Wagner, Wagner, to our PTA Council VP and Deputy VP of Education, Shweta Chowdhury and Linda Hennigan for also making this possible. And on behalf of the PTA Council and the League of Women Voters, thank you everyone for being with us today. Recording will be available at our Palo Alto PTA Council website, www.paloaltopta.org. Thank you again and have a wonderful night. Oh, a special thanks. I would like to give a special thanks, sorry, to Jennifer DiBrianza for a uh, board member for jumping in. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and so much also to Vice Major um, Greer Stone. Thank you. Good night.